I actually find that most sellers and most agents don't do anything to change a home, even if the decor is a bit dated, a bit backward, a bit, bit untidy. Um, I've seen more than my fair share of properties that are kind of sold as is, with really no thought whatsoever insofar as improving the aesthetic. Um, you know, to talk about the US, as we've just done, but insofar as how they deal with such properties, I mean, everything is renovated, refurbished, tweaked, polished, staged. Welcome to the D and A of Home Interiors. I'm Audrey, founder of Audrey Whelan Interior Design. I'm Deirdre, the co-founder of Cool Dia. We're here to help you make confident home interior and furnishing decisions. So today we're really excited to welcome Russell Quirk to our podcast. Now, Russell, you've worn many hats over your career to date, and I'm fascinated to hear a little bit more about that. But today we're really going to focus on your experience in and around homes, selling homes, buying homes, what we can do around our home interiors and our home furnishings in order to add value or maybe to make our homes sell much quicker and much easier. But perhaps you want to give us a little introduction on yourself and in terms of your experience and what you've done, because it's super interesting. Well, thank you for saying so. And uh, hello, thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, no, I, I do have quite a bit of experience, I suppose. So 25 years or so in estate agency. So a combination of what I guess you'd call traditional estate agency, but I also founded a business called eMove, which was one of the first digital estate agencies, um, which went horribly wrong at the end of 2018. But let's just park that for a second. Um, so I've sold, um, I hate to admit really, uh, quite a few thousand homes, uh, either individually or as part of businesses that I've founded uh, and run. Uh, latterly, I have founded a PR business called Propaganda, which is particularly property focused. So we have a number of property clients uh, that we gain media coverage for uh, pretty successfully. Um, and then because uh, I kind of always thought that at the end of the e-move reign, really, that I would always have to get back into a state agency one way or the other, I came across a business which is a US-based business called Keller Williams, and the guy that runs that in the UK, a guy called Ben Taylor, contacted me last year, funny enough to do their PR. Uh, and after a, a few meetings and conversations, I was pretty convinced enough by the model, which if you want to, we can go into a little bit more, uh, to invest in a franchise, a territory in Essex, which is where um, I'm, I'm ashamed to say that I'm from. Um, and um, so we've invested in that with a view to expanding the Keller Williams brand and model across Essex. So I'm, I'm kind of back into a state agency and, and hovering really between, you know, estate agency, PR, and, and I still like to do a bit of media really in terms of kind of building personal brand, which I think is also quite an important thing, whoever you are really, whether you're in an agency or in any other sector. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of me really. That's yeah. amazing. So I suppose having sold thousands of homes, those are the insights that we're hoping to get into today. First thoughts, what sells, what doesn't? Um, so, it, it, look, it really, really depends, I think, because the UK property market is no longer one property market. So in years gone by, you talk about the market being up or the market being down or values being up 2% or down 3% or whatever. Um, but now there is a huge regional variation. So there's definitely a split between the London market and the rest of the UK. And then there's a split between kind of different different regions, really. So you can have prices going down by 2 or 3% in one part of the UK, and prices going up elsewhere. So it, it, it really does depend. Um, I think that your choice of agent has to be important. Um, not all estate agents are the same even though you tend to find that a lot of sellers, when they're choosing an agent, just kind of ring five or six and go for the cheapest fee, and they wonder why it's all gone horribly wrong three or four months later and they haven't sold their home because they've gone for the cheapest. Uh, there is definitely a difference and a disparity from one agent to so another. on that point, because I was thinking around how do I make my home more sellable, but actually then... What, what should I be looking for when I'm hiring an estate agent? What are the questions I should ask? So, so th this then speaks to the Keller model, really, which is, look, first of all, you have to be comfortable with the person that comes to see you to value the home. So are they knowledgeable? Are they experienced? But also, do they kind of give you 
do they give you a sense of confidence, really, that they know the market, they really know what they're talking about? You know, if they're in and out of your home in 10 minutes and then you don't hear from them again, then I'd argue that, look, they're not particularly consummate. They're probably looking at you and the whole sector, really, as a transaction rather than a relationship. And, and there's a real big difference, I think, in terms of those agents that look upon agency and house selling as a relationship thing rather than just transaction. Um, so, and, and look, in, in terms of the way that different agents operate, you know, some are more accessible than others. You know, some are still doing, believe it or not, the nine to five thing, Monday to Friday, close on a Saturday afternoon and a Sunday. Um, you know, if you ring them, you can still hear the answer phone clicking in, you know, like you could in the old days. Mm -hmm. And then there are other agents that are kind of 24 seven and that communicate by text and WhatsApp and um, are very active on social media and so on. So. I think you've got to be comfortable, very, very comfortable with the agent. Um, different agents operate in different ways in terms of where they advertise. So some, most are on right move, which is pretty important. Uh, a number of them are on Zoopla, but then some tend to choose between Zoopla and on the market, which is the third biggest property portal. I actually think it's important to be on at least two, if not all three of those. Um, and then, of course, there's a difference in terms of the way that agents themselves choose to market. So some of us will say, okay, well, if you've got a particularly attractive home that is six, seven, eight hundred thousand pounds and needs to be shown off, you should really expect that the photographer that turns up is a proper, dedicated, professional photographer that's going to think about lighting and angles and so on. Whereas some agents, believe it or not, will whip out their iPhone 5, take a few pictures and stick those on right move an hour later. Um, and, and, you know, pictures as a first impression online are really, really important, you know, to kind of enthuse people and actually get them to inquire to come along. Um, floor plans, very important. The amount of agents that don't use floor plans still amazes me. So agents are definitely different. Um, and, and I think when it comes to employing an agent, you, you've got to spend a proper amount of time almost interviewing them, really. Um, it's not just about the value. It's about really interrogating them and asking them all the same questions in terms of, you know, what are your opening hours? How do I communicate with you? What houses have you sold nearby? What percentage of the asking price did you get for them? Um, oh, and by the way, have you got anybody that I can speak to that can recommend you? Um, most people don't do that. Um, and, and an agent that's worth their salt should be able to kind of pull out of their, their case, out of their bag very quickly, a bunch of people nearby that are so happy with the service that they previously delivered that they'll say, yeah, no, I've got two or three people that if you call them, uh, that will, I'm sure, attest to, to how good I am. Um, I'm always a bit sceptical of the, of, the, of the references because, of course, you'll always find somebody who can say something good. Yeah. But if the last three guys have said something bad, you're not going to ask for those. Yeah, Should I you become so. a customer first? So you go and view a property with the agent and see how you're treated. I had one incident where I uh, rang up and I tried to view an apartment and uh, the receptionist said she would get the agent to ring me back and they never rang me back. And I was like, why if would I, I use was, you to sell? Yeah. If I was selling my property yeah. with that person and they weren't even contacting potential buyers back, I would have been livid. Yeah, yeah. Or, or yes, you, I think that's a, a, a good suggestion, but also just to inquire via right move. So inquire at about eight o'clock at night about a property that you purport to be interested in and see if you get a response. The stats are, believe it or not, that something like 25% of all right move inquiries that are sent by right move as a consequence of potential buyers inquiring with right move that are sent to the agent, 25% are ignored. They're never opened, never corresponded with, no one ever gets a call. It, it is astonishing. Given yeah, that right move. really high. And, and yeah. Right move now charges about £1,400 per agency branch per month. Wow. So it's a really expensive medium. Yeah. And, and so for that stat to be correct as apparently it is that 25% of those inquiries that basically 25% of the the cash that that business could have coming in doesn't come in as a consequence so mm. I think you can test them just with a simple right move or resume per inquiry to see if they respond yeah. um, and, and and then it comes down to fee to an extent but I think as we touched on just now really the 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 thing not to do is just to go for the cheapest agent. It, if someone says to me now, if I'm ever out listing a home, which I still do, by the way, here and there, um, you know, what's your fee? And that's one of their first questions. I kind of think, do you know what? I'm probably not for you, really. Um, do you remember the old Volkswagen adverts with the parachutes where the guy comes in and there's an old secondhand one that hasn't been tested properly, hasn't been packed, but it's cheap? Do you want that parachute or do you want the proper one? You know, you, you can have quality or price. Choose one. Yeah. You can only <clears throat> choose one. You're, you're never going to get 100% quality at the cheapest price. It just doesn't exist. And, and frankly, a decent agent, you know, shouldn't really want to undersell themselves 
by accepting a fee of half a percent or 0.75 percent that that's the agent to avoid because they obviously don't have that much confidence in themselves and their ability what about building in an incentive into the fee yeah no you can so uh, there's again it's not very prevalent really um i mean obviously most fees are percentage based and are contingent on selling the property so it's built in i suppose that the better the price achieved the more the agent earns but to actually boost that is is interesting. So I, I listed a house very recently uh, near to where I live in, in Hutton at £3.2 million. Um, and the deal is that if I get above £3 million, I get 2% above that £3 million, as opposed to a lower fee for the bulk of the £3 million, if you like. So, um, and, and it can work. So I'm now massively incentivized you know to me it's worth four figures it's worth thousands of pounds to see get i like that idea hmm? yeah. because i know that you've got the percentage of the sale so obviously the higher the sale the bigger your percentage but then there's also a time element yeah and if you're turning down a buyer when is another one going to come along that's maybe you know going to yeah, be willing to pay higher the, the, the caveat is one of the biggest problems with property sales right now and i know we'll come on to kind of talking about how you can enhance the property and kind of help yourself in terms of a, a leg up but one of the biggest problems is the perception that sellers have of the value of their home everybody wants to believe that their property is worth perhaps more than it is so you know you get five valuations and some people will go and plump for the agent that just gave them the highest valuation which is lunacy i mean it's not Mm. shopping around for the best part exchange price this is someone just sticking their finger in the air and telling you that they're going to get you more than anybody else in a market that's the same for everybody Um, so yeah it's the realism around value so doing your homework looking not just at what asking prices are on right move but actually looking at sold prices on hm land registry that's a big tip and actually if you get three four or five agents round, there will always be a disparity in value my recommendation is always to take the average so you know if someone says 500 and someone says 550 and someone says 600 well the average is 550 that's what you should be marketing for yeah there are some agents mentioning no names in london that are big um yeah let's not go there um that are kind of guilty of habitually overvaluing they yes. do it on yeah. purpose well and then sign yeah. you up for 16 weeks nice mm-hmm. long sole agency agreement after four weeks you think why have i had no viewers yeah. you ring that agent says well it's quiet brexit coronavirus all these other mm-hmm. things you know that are uh, the, the excuses that are used um and then of course they insist encourage you know bully you really to reduce the price of your home mm-hmm. during that sole agency agreement so the agent ultimately still gets the deal but you were bamboozled into using them on false pretenses. So yeah. should we sign into sole agency agreements? Sole agency, within reason, they're a good protection for the agent, for the agent to be able to then invest time, effort and money into your listing. So if, if you didn't sign, then that agent really is going to be concerned because it may well be after a week you say, well, thanks for your efforts, thanks for doing the photos and the floor plan and spending all this time, money and effort on my listing, but I'm now going somewhere else. So I think so, within reason, but eight weeks, eight weeks is what I think is an acceptable period of time in most markets. Some agents are signing people up and asking them to sign agreements of 20 and more weeks, which doesn't really give you confidence that they're able to sell your property, again, based on the value that they've given you. It probably doesn't align with they've said that they're going to sell it within two to three weeks as well and have all of these viewings. So maybe you have a get out clause after four weeks if they haven't gotten you the viewings or a certain number. Yeah, maybe. But then it does come down to value because one of the biggest problems is, you know, and I've had this several times recently, you'll say to somebody, OK, your, your home is worth X. And the owner, of course, says, OK, thanks for providing me mountains of evidence that supports what you've just said. <laughs> I'd like to try it higher. And that's a conversation <laughs> agents across the country have every day. Then, of course, three, four, five weeks later... If, if it's the owner's price, not the agent's price, not the market price, you can't really blame the agent for not having sent people around. So it is a balance. So I think if, if there's a conversation between agent and seller that you're going to be sensible in terms of price, then, and, and you know, particularly if the agent says it's worth 300000 you say, okay, stick it on the market at that, then the, the agent needs to kind of live or die by that, really. And so, Russell, on this subject of different agents and different approaches, what would you say about the idea of sort of online estate agents versus the more traditional kind of bricks and mortar ones on the high street that we see? It's actually something I've had discussions about many times with clients who are preparing to put their properties on the market, but one I've never got sort of clear answers on myself. So it'd be great to hear your thoughts on that. 
Yeah, and, and I guess I'm quite qualified to talk about this, having been both a traditional and an online agent. Um, I suppose we should define what an online agent is as well. Mm-hmm. It's not just an agent that advertises online, because of course all agents do. So you know, all of the traditional guys are on Rightmove and or Zoopla and on the market and have their own websites. So I, 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 I guess the definition really is that an online agent is one that doesn't have face-to-face branches. They have a kind of big call center. But really the definition is agents that charge a fixed fee rather than a percentage, rather than a contingency mm-hmm. fee. And it's generally paid or committed to upfront. And actually, from my experience at eMove, therein lies the problem. In fact, two problems. One is that if you're paying an agent or committing to pay them regardless of outcome, that, that's a bit of a scary prospect for most people, particularly if the market is somewhat fragile. So that, that kind of doesn't work for most. Um, but actually, cheap fees, psychologically, are also a problem. So, I mean, to, to talk about a few, so there's Purple Bricks, there's How Simple, there's Yopa. Um, actually, a lot of online agents have closed over the last two or three years, so not, not just eMove, but a number of others. Um, and But one of the problems is the consumer perception that, Paying just a thousand pounds, let's say, to sell your home, particularly if it's tricky to sell, tricky market, it is actually not enough for that to be successful. So that there's a real issue with that, and and you know it's fair to say different agents are different to each other in the online space in terms of what they do and don't do, but but generally online agents are more hands off, a bit more anonymous. They are not going to give you the kind of care and attention and, and also the local knowledge that perhaps a traditional stroke high street or what, what now are called hybrid agents uh, can offer. You're probably going to ask me now, what's the difference between a traditional agent and a hybrid agent? Yeah, that would uh-huh. be good to know that. <laughs> so, um, and yeah, here's where it gets a bit confusing, I suppose. So if you think about a traditional agent as a as a Foxton, a Bester Weaves, a Reeds Reigns, a Martian Parsons, so lots of offices, very traditional. Uh, you'll call them, they'll come around, value your home, charge you one and a half, two percent or whatever, and that gets paid on contingent, uh, you know, contingent on successful sale. Um, but they have lots and lots of branches. And, and, and actually, look, a, a, a good... Um, and are kind of embedded into that local market and that community, but they have they have huge overheads. And actually, from an industry perspective, the people that work in estate agency that work for those big corporates, the likes of Countrywide and LSL and so on, they actually don't earn much money. I mean, the the, the average agent in the UK earns about thirty thousand pounds a year. Then park that for a second and do what I've just done, which is to go to the US and talk to lots and lots of US real estate agents. And they delight in telling you in bars, restaurants, you know, at the breakfast table, in queues. or Driving lines. around in their Porsches. Yeah, no, but what they earn. And, and you know, when I was, I was at a Keller Williams conference in Dallas three weeks ago, and there was um, a couple of ladies behind me that I, you know, got talking to. And um, this lady must have been in her mid-late 60s, you know, quite small and, you know, fragile she was, I have to say. And um, when she told me what she earned last year, it was absolutely astonishing. $350,000 as an agent in mm. Albuquerque, which actually has one of the lowest prices for property in the United States. Um, then I was in a bar later that day, started speaking to some British agents that were uh, now in the US and had been for some time, uh, Oakland, California. And, you know, Justine, one of the ones, uh, one of the, the ladies I was talking to, told me that she earned $750,000 last year. Now, I know that might sound obscene, and people listening to this might say, well, I don't want my agent earning that much money. That's, that's you know, it's terrible. Um, and, you know, might want to get all Jeremy Corbyn about it. But, but think about it for a sec. If your agent is really well remunerated and really, therefore, incentivized to look after you, where basically that fee is kind of, all or nothing. If they sell your property, they get paid and they get paid a lot, which means A, they have to sell it, but they also, you know, they, they are incentivized to want to look after you, to want to communicate with you on a kind of, you know, regular basis. So I, I think that agents need to be paid a lot, lot more. That will then raise standards. More homes will get sold for better prices. The experience will be better. We won't have this industry as we have now, the estate agency industry in the UK, which I think is largely vilified by the public. The public think estate agents are terrible. And in, in most of these uh, these kind of polls that you see, I mean, every year there's one which puts estate agents down there with kind of some journalists and traffic wardens generally. Um, 
And, you know, with that, that standard and that perception, I think, needs to change. But it actually changes through people... Uh, people almost allowing agents to, to earn more money. Yeah, so I'm absolutely fascinated about those differences between the US market and what's happening here. So, I mean, what other differences are there? There's got to be more behind that, surely. Well, no, I mean, the, the I mean, the, there are businesses like, and let's be fair, although I'm, I've got my kind of Keller Williams hat, there are other US businesses that are coming to the UK to try and expand the US model. So businesses like EXP and to a to a much lesser extent, businesses like uh, Remax and Century Twenty One, they're not focused on expensive bricks and mortar branches and, um, and and those those trappings. They're focused on training, compliance, technology, but above all, allowing the agent to earn. So, with Keller Williams, for instance, the agent earns sixty three percent of the entire fee. So they make a ten grand fee by selling something at two percent at five hundred thousand pound sale price, for instance. They earn six thousand pounds. Now, you know, in the high street, that same agent would earn about three or four hundred quid. So mm-hmm. I think a lot of it is about earnings, but but the earnings then facilitate a better industry overall, more investment in technology. Uh, you know, you're you're much more likely to want to be trained and therefore be better if you know that the consequence of that training is that you're you're going to get more listings and you're going to yes. get better prices mm-hmm. and so on. So I I think the estate agency industry in the UK, to everybody's detriment, has been really dumbed down. Yeah, mm-hmm. my mom always says you uh, pay for what you get. Very true. So maybe it's a case of that. Very so true. maybe moving away from um, the the real estate agent, what have you seen in relation to the spec of properties that you've sold? You've sold thousands of homes, so mm. you must have hundreds of insights from that. Um, you know, people often talk about putting in a new bathroom, putting in a new kitchen, giving it a paint. Should I add new carpets? What should I do to my house to make it more sellable? Decluttering is probably uh, top of the list as well. Where have you seen people make big changes? Maybe they've put on their home originally and then taken it off and uh, redid some of the decor and, and tried to sell it mm. afterwards. Um, where have you seen people add value and where have you seen them maybe waste money on things that consumers weren't willing to pay for? I think first off, the answer is that most people don't make any changes at all. I mean, astonishingly, given the you know the, the stats say that people will make up their mind about whether they want to buy a property in maybe the first thirty seconds of being in the home. I actually find that most sellers and most agents don't do anything to change a home, even if the decor is a bit dated, a bit backward, a bit bit untidy. Um, I've seen more than my fair share of properties that are kind of sold as is with really no thought whatsoever insofar as improving the aesthetic. Um, you know, to talk about the US, uh, as we've just done, but insofar as how they deal with such properties, I mean, everything is renovated, refurbished, tweaked, polished, staged, um, and, and, you know, in a, in a remarkably more constructive and beneficial way than in the UK. So so actually, what should be done, and you would think, listening to this, it's pretty obvious. If, you've, if you're selling an old dated property, spend a couple of thousand pounds on you know, decorating neutrally, tidying up the garden, making sure that all of the obvious first impression things like the front door, bathrooms in particular, because if you're like me, I, I, I judge a lot of things, um, like hotel rooms on the state of the bathroom. So, you know, having... A dated bathroom with kind of, you know, mouldy old taps that are all tarnished rather than spending a hundred quid on new, you know, new sanitary um, fittings as such. I, I'm, I'm amazed that more, more sellers don't make the effort, but more agents don't encourage those sellers to. Um, there is a huge difference insofar as a property that has been beautifully decorated and really thoughtfully presented and how quick it sells and what for. So, and, and, and this is quite an anomaly, really, that you can have almost two identical properties that have only, inverted commas, been decorated better, or one of them has only been decorated better, and, and it will sell for a disproportionate amount of money, even though it's kind of only decor. I, I, I think, unfortunately, a lot of the public maybe don't have... I don't say this unkindly, but I just think it's a matter of fact. They just don't have the imagination to, to see, see... the potential. Yeah, to see what a property could be. So... The seller that does that for them and says, hey, look how nice this could be in terms of, you know, even the basic things like sanitary fittings, tiles, flooring, um, even lighting and so on, and definitely furnishings, you know, it really gives the property an edge. And, and as an agent, I've often been really surprised 
that something will achieve more than what I thought the ceiling for that type of property in that road was because you walk in and say, wow, this is like a show home. It, it really makes a difference. But isn't it incredible that most properties don't get sold like that? There, there's also a definite difference between London and the rest of the UK. And maybe that's because there's a price difference. So if you're selling a £750,000 flat somewhere in Battersea, for instance, and it's empty, maybe you can afford and should afford to spend a bit of money on certainly staging that property, not, not just enhancing it, but making sure that buyers can see how it would look uh, if you were to buy it, move in and so, have furniture. <clears throat> Well, so this concept of staging, so you've mentioned that word a few times now, and so sort of first of all in relation to the US market. And so it's a term that I use sometimes, home staging, and um, which I guess is kind of different to maybe the more fundamentals of sort of refitting kitchens and bathrooms. But can you define that phrase for us? Yeah, home staging. It, it, it's almost unheard of though, I think, in the UK. Mm. It, again, except at the top end of the London market. Yeah. So, you know, selling something at five, ten million quid, it, it's quite quite prevalent and there are businesses certainly that specialize in renting furniture for the purposes of staging mm -hmm. so, so essentially what staging is is dressing a property like a show home do you know when you go to a new build development yeah. and you know what they could do is just show you a floor plan i suppose mm -hmm. or they could show you a bare shell of a flat they don't do that yeah. they they actually dress it and spend quite a bit of money on lots of aspects and not just the furniture but you know the 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 soft furnishings, the you know the the, the lighting, um, you know pictures on the wall, ornaments and so on. Because and I, I guess what it is, it's making a difference between it being a house and a home. Yeah. Now I know that seems a bit you know what the hell is he talking about? But but there is a huge difference because people don't buy houses as such; they buy something to live in as a home. And and I think if you can trick the imagination, if you like, insofar as saying, look at how this thing's going to look. But not, as you say, not just by kind of refurbishing it so it looks quite nice, but actually dressing it with a sofa and a bed and bedside tables and so on. It will sell better, sell quicker, and it will sell for, for more money. There are some stats on this, if you want me to kind of okay, elaborate yeah, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very I couldn't find, honestly, any UK stats because it, it's staging is such an underserved thing in the UK, particularly in the mainstream market. You know, average house price, £240,000. I mean, staging's, I mean, it just doesn't exist. So, but the US do it a lot and they do it very, very well. There are some stats, so there's some stats, stats that I found on Forbes, that a property that is staged, so in other words, money has been invested in renting the furniture and dressing the property as if it were a home, that property can sell for up to 17% more if it's staged versus it not being staged. And that's astonishing. I mean, it's mm -hmm. huge. And also that 95% of homes that are staged will sell within two weeks, mm -hmm. which is 87% more and 87% higher than properties that are not staged. Mm -hmm. So when, when you look at the data, when you look at the stats, it's madness that the, the staging industry in the UK isn't huge. Yeah. It certainly should be. Yeah. It's really interesting because I suppose you talked about a house versus a home. And, and that's what it is. It's highly emotive. Yep. It's where you're going to live. It's where you're going to have your friends over. It's where you're going to have your dinner parties. It's where your kids are going to play on that couch. Yeah, it's so, where you're going to make memories for the rest of your life. Yeah. Oh, do you use you that like line? That. <laughs> You can have that. You can You're have smooth. that. Yeah. But, but it's definitely, it's that aspirational thing, isn't it? Where, you know, I mean, I talk to people about wanting the buyer to come in and actually identify with that and for it to evoke emotion that they want to be connected with this place. And, yeah. you know. They, and, they and I think, am I allowed to say this in a room full of women? Is It's a male, female thing as well. So, you know, us fellas might see maybe or am i really saying this yeah let's just say it might just see the pound shillings and pence mm -hmm. women are responsible for over 80 percent of all purchase decisions whether they're property whether it's cars yeah, or whatever yeah. um I, my my belief uh, and look, shoot me down in flames if you like is that a staged home that looks nice homely and done nicely is going to attract the female eye and therefore the deal is more likely to get done yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. No, no, that's 100%. We've done a lot of research into it and it's, it's firmly backed up by what you've just said. Wow. Wow. In fact, we have um, one retailer on um, the Kuldia website. They are called New Concept Furnishings and they don't actually rent the furniture, but what they will do is they will provide a package for your home ready-made. Oh, wow. so, so you kind of move straight in kind of thing. 
Exactly. But it's not only with the move straight in. They've actually told us that they actually get approached by people who want to buy the furniture because they know that they can move it from property to property if they have a lot of properties. Mm. But for using it for sale to actually stage it and that people can imagine. And it goes right through, as you said, it's the pictures, it's the cushions, it's the rug. And all of a sudden, that is a home, not yeah. just an empty shell. And maybe not everybody wants to go through the laborious process of choosing every colour, every cushion every aspect of the home which you know some people enjoy for some people you know that's that's why they want to refurbish or move home but not everybody wants to do that yeah. so if you can piggyback somebody else's creativity that look, it makes perfect sense yeah know? it's um, also time for people sometimes isn't it you know yeah, that exactly. they may actually like it and be interested in doing that kind of thing but the time involved in sourcing everything and putting it together and i think as well you know we were just saying about sort of yeah it's the artwork the cushions it's all those accessories as well i mean it's mm. one thing to actually furnish functionally and sort of have the right size and types of sofas and beds and tables yeah, I just, but it's another thing to put that extra layer then of accessorizing and that's where the staging yeah, aspect I guess, it's, it's like walking in. around and Ikea and they kind of they, they model out different rooms yeah. so lounge one lounge yeah. two lounge. I, I wonder how many people walk around and go yeah I just want that yes <laughs> that, yeah. that's fine well I think people <laughs> go thing. in saying I'm looking for a desk maybe but then when they go to the particular desk they see a lamp on the desk yeah. pictures on the wall a notice exactly. board and storage containers and yeah, they, yeah. and then look there's nothing wrong yeah. with that I think you know as we say everybody's different some people are definitely time poor mm. um, I actually probably would be one of those people that would would buy the package you know as long as I can see what the package is and I can you know yeah I, I, I can kind of put my thumbs up to it if you like. I, I would be one of those people that would say, "Yeah, just just deliver it, fit it, and let me know when it's ready." Maybe that goes yeah. back to the bloke thing. Probably, yeah, it's maybe. Done. And <laughs> you know, it may depend on the type of property as well. I guess in, in some cases that you know the package may work. Then maybe in a more unusual property, it might yeah. be more necessary to diversify a bit more in the type. Or different of levels of package. Are, you know, maybe yeah. you, you can have a kind of base package which is the furniture, but you don't then have to have all the adornments if you like. Mm. Yeah. So. Some quick fire round questions for you. Uh oh, right. Pets, yes or no? Should they be in the house? Are they are? What for they? viewings? Yes. Depends how cute they are. Um, oh, I don't know. I mean, I've got a big dog. Uh, would I take the dog out for a walk while the house has been shown? Yeah, I probably would. Um, I'm, I'm not so worried about you know the evidence of a pet. And, and look, if you if you keep a decent home and you've got a pet, it's unlikely to stink of pets, is it? Um, but it's just it's the kind of yeah, the aggravation and the jumping up and the fact that some people are scared of certain animals. I mean, you put me in a property that I'm viewing and you walk into the kind of second bedroom and there's aquariums full of snakes. I'm oh, my God. I running. actually had that in one of my viewings. Really? There was yeah. a snake in the bedroom. In oh. the, yeah, but in a that. tank. Yeah, in a tank. Yeah. It yeah, was I'm, horrible. I, I would not go into that no. room. They just give me the Yeah, yeah the, I also had a beautiful experience in my apartment um, where they had a cat and in the period between when we put the offer on and when we moved in, the cat was allowed to urinate every place. So that was a beautiful experience. So I'm a very uh, <laughs> aversion uh, to cats. Yeah, no. I, I don't think you can cover it up as such. But um, but yeah, I think that if you've got big dogs and uh, uh, let's say questionable pets, then yeah, take them out for the viewings. What about fragrances? Because I think some people can be allergic to them in one way. Should you be lighting candles? Should you have flowers? I mean, the first impressions are really important, I think. Um, I also think most people know that when they move in and they've kind of redecorated and made it their home, that the fragrance, the aroma is going to be their own, I suppose. Um, but I suppose, yeah, look, better to have something artificial than something bad as an aroma, I suppose. Um, but I, I don't buy into the you know, ground coffee and freshly baked yeah. bread thing. Oh, um, I was going to ask about the baked bread. I no, but there are some <laughs> studies that say that that's, that's a thing. Have you ever had it? No, oh. I don't think so. And I've definitely <clears throat> never, never recommended it. Um, but I think it goes back to the, the home thing. You know, what, mm. what that is kind of prodding, I suppose, is our human instinct that as you walk into a home and it smells like home rather than it smelling like a house, that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, those smells can make a difference. I've got experience of those from working uh, with a couple of kitchen brands many years ago, designing their showrooms, and we used to use a few of the different smells. So uh, the bread one and the coffee one were the most popular. But yeah, the, the showrooms really felt like that was a, yeah. a good aid. It, it, it's quite a yeah. science, isn't it? Aren't there different businesses that use different smells for different things? Is it casinos? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, they, they kind of pump different smells in because that then invokes... 
uh, I don't know, you wanted to then spend money in the restaurant or mm, whatever it might yeah. be. Maybe the yeah, smell of money makes hungry. you want to yeah. gamble more. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What about the most off-putting thing that you've seen in one of the properties that you've been selling? That That's the feedback that, you know, the viewers have all had that this item or, or this feature was terrible. Um, two things, really. People that have tried to do, do you remember the... Um, do you remember the program Changing Rooms? With oh, Lawrence yes. Robin and Bowen? I remember it well. Yeah, Pe- yeah. People that have tried to improve their home themselves without a clue. Mm. You know, so hammerite on the radiators, you know, purple ceilings. Painting tiles. Yeah. yeah it, it, walls in the bedroom that are entirely mirrored. That's mm-hmm. odd. Um, and so on. Did you see any ceilings with mirrors? <laughs> no. but I, And people with portraits of themselves in their bedrooms you think that's just really weird um the, the worst thing though is individual apart- yeah yeah unique that yeah is that weird no one in here has got a portrait of themselves are they above their bed i mean that's just strange no. i've seen <laughs> no, stuff like nobody that nobody here i don't know um i think but apart from people that have tried to improve their home and have really kind of missed the target it's just badly presented homes i mean i, I valued properties where i walk in and there's kind of dogs lying all over the floor there's a teenager lying on the sofa and you walk into the bedrooms and there's overflowing ashtrays and stuff like that you just think you've probably just lost 10% of the value of this property just because you didn't spend an hour, you know, cleaning your, your mess up. Yeah. Um, so I think that people can do themselves favours uh, in terms of just keeping a decent home. But but I, you do see some odd, odd things sometimes, I must admit, you know, where, where people have, we talked about taste and creativity. Some people can take that too far, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I was just thinking, I mean, I, I personally, I mean, I've bought two properties in London. I've probably seen at least 50 on each of those rounds. And yeah, absolutely a real mixed bag of things. One thing I noticed was um, in particular, you know, when properties are tenanted and then they're on the market, it can be quite difficult sometimes to control maybe those yeah. overflowing ashtrays and, and neighbours, things like that. Neighbours, yeah. you know, you um, obviously when you see a listing on the property portals, you, you tend to see a kind of cropped picture of just that property. You then pull up and see that next door's got a kind of cortina on axle stands and kind of, yeah. you know, old gas canisters outside. That's definitely going to put people off. Yeah. I mean, I, but what you do about that, I don't know, apart from trying to have a kind of kindly word with the neighbour, you know, yeah. can you clean your act up please yeah. but I mean they, I guess it's it's interesting isn't it because sometimes I've seen you know people have enhanced their home to such a point that when they rent it the types of tenants they get then are is sort of of a higher caliber because mm. they want to live in a more desirable space and therefore they look after it better yeah. and so it's quite an interesting psychology behind that so then you know the hope is if they come to sell it then they have a tenant who's uh, you know and more sort of in tune with that process and yeah. you know is keeping it neat and tidy for themselves genuinely yeah, yeah true true but of course we, we we do have a problem in the uk in terms of tenancy agreements generally because they tend to to be 12 months at a time which means it doesn't give people enough tenure really in terms of them being able to kind of put proper roots down and call that property their home you know and, and actually staging when you talk about staging and nice furniture and furnishings and so on that equally applies to a nice you know a rented property that mm-hmm. you're going to be in for yeah. three four five years um but the problem is with a short short old tenancy agreements generally being for 12 months at a time you know, where the landlord could decide at that 12-month anniversary that, you know, he wants to sell it now or rent yeah. it to somebody else. That doesn't lend itself to you wanting to kind of really invest in the property. I think that has to yeah. change. And yeah. the governments over the last few years, really, have talked about extending those assured short hold tenancy agreements to be three years and five years. I don't know why they don't do that. Because if the landlord wants to let for three years and the tenant wants to commit for three years or more, 10 years even, why not let them both do that? Why not provide a an agreement and a mechanism to allow them to do that yes no, very good yeah. and then on the opposite side of the bad things that you've seen what are some of the good things the good features that people have commented on that people have liked that tends to to make a difference oh good question i guess yeah it, the flip side of what we just talked about you know people that really understand that whether we like it or not neutrality is just it's kind of the the way forward when it comes to trying to sell something. Um, you know, not trying to be too edgy and too creative. Um, you know, people that have decorated the home so it kind of suits the majority, really. Um, people that have made good use of space. Uh, one of the bigging things now, which I really like to see when I go and look at a property, is these kind of ground floor extensions off the kitchen where you've now got a kind of 30 foot by 25 foot open kitchen, sitting room, dining room space um you know for the sake of whatever it ends up being not that much money 
to add not just space but real usable kind of heart of the home type space i think is a is a massive benefit um and attic rooms as well you know you can you can go up into the loft now generally without planning permission so in most properties it's kind of depending on what other extensions you've had already it's a uh, a case of permitted development so you only need building regulations to make sure that you know the thing's safe um that can really add value uh, particularly in places where the pound per square foot of your property is already high. And then the other thing, of course, that's been really, really prevalent, but less so now, is basements. Now, basements kind of hold a, hide a multitude of sins. You know, you've probably seen these stories, particularly in the Daily Mail, actually, they seem to be, where you know people have kind of gone down three stories and then out mm. what they call iceberg developments, where you can see yeah. the house at the top, but the majority of the property is actually underneath. Mm. And somehow they're allowed to go down and under everybody else's property. I've never quite understood that. Um, but then, of course, there have been problems in terms of legal disputes, collapses, mm-hmm. and so yeah. on. But, you know, I, I've got friends in Notting Hill that have got this, I'm sure they won't mind me saying, quite tiny two-bed property. They spent £300,000 going down into the basement, but they added about £500,000 to the value just based on the square footage that they created. So mm-hmm. that, that makes a lot of sense. And, um, yeah, I think that that within reasons to be encouraged. So I think, you know, being, being clever about the space... And, and I guess the other thing is, if you live in something old, you know, as an architect, we we would have designed and we did design properties very differently, you know, in the late 1900s, even in the 1970s. Um, you know, a lot of 1970s homes don't have en-suites. Mm. If you can find a way of not losing a bedroom but putting an en-suite in, particularly, you know, it might be that you go up into the loft, then then again, that that is hugely beneficial, I think. I think also downstairs toilets in old houses, period properties, you know, mm. uh, uh, that can be something that always seems to be attractive to people yeah. um, if people are able to put one in. Um, but actually, I really picked up on um, just a word you said, which was neutrality. Mm. And I wanted to question this a little bit more and um, because I feel I've noticed um, a kind of a, ch- a changing trend here over the years, but it could be kind of more to do with people, you know, I've come in contact with to do with interior design, but where, you know, people are not feeling in general um, uh, as strongly about needing to maybe keep everything white or cream because they're going to sell the property, whereas that was a much stronger theme Mm. I felt was there sort of going back kind of closer to a decade ago. Yeah, you see Um, a lot more greys and silvers and pastel colours. Yeah, I guess so. That's definitely more prevalent. I just think you've got to be very careful. It's a bit like design generally. You know, if you design something that's very, very niche and very today, mm-hmm. whether it's interior decor or whether it's the actual aesthetic of the property, mm-hmm. it can date really, really quickly. Yeah. Um, and I think you know you've got to be very careful with that. Um, mm-hmm. But but I think yeah, I still think neutrality is key. And I guess no, you're right. It doesn't have to be whites and magnolias. Yeah. So that word neutrality, you're saying with a bit of a broader sphere, yeah, maybe guess. than what some people might imagine. Yes. yes. Maybe not yeah. the polka dot wallpaper. Yes. Uh, no, no, definitely not. And kind of uh, yeah, no yellow ceilings and. Uh, purple chairs so yeah. it's like kind um, of joker's playroom yeah because yeah, just on that note and in another sort of interesting observation i've noticed a number of times now is people getting in touch with me when they've bought a property which is in amazing condition often it will be an older property and it's been refurbished new kitchen new bathrooms but it's all been d- done um, in an absolute neutral mm. kind of style where everything's white cream but things like you know big slab floor tiles on a huge open plan kitchen diner extension like you talked about Mm. in a sort of an off-white colour, white kitchen units, mm. a very pale splashback worktop. And all this, you know, still costs a substantial amount of money. And people have a real sort of um, confusion to do with it then because they've bought into this because they were desperate for a property on that street. Mm. And they realise everything's new. They're concerned about sort of sustainability as well. And they feel really terrible about the prospect of kind of removing it and throwing it out. So often I'm coming in and sort of advising them then, well, what bits could you keep? How can we do this? sort of in a you know cost effective way but to bring in a certain amount of elements that actually lift this mm. you know and, and sort of give, give you you know a bit more individual it's such an individual thing yeah it? and you can spend a fortune bringing in you know interior designers and so on then the next person comes along and says yeah it's lovely but it's just actually i don't like blue yeah. or green it's, yeah. it's not my yeah. thing I want to change it all yeah and that's the problem with doing that to sell isn't it but it's almost like sometimes I think you know the selling palette almost needs to be maybe somewhat adaptable so you know maybe really expensive materials aren't used in kind of more permanent areas such as flooring yeah. and well, someone is to invent soft furnishings that can change colour yeah let's uh, 
yeah, maybe that's oh, a I start once uh, came across a lipstick that changes color on the individual to be the color for that person. Really? Wow. Yeah, and okay. I think there's yeah. plants. I think there are some plants in the pipeline for paints that change. But and color tiles, as well. you can imagine floor yeah. tiles and yeah. wall tiles that could change yeah. color. You know, depending yeah. on you know maybe the the amount of yeah. electricity flow that goes through. You know, like those mm. windows that you can press a button and they get immediately go opaque. Yes, which is yeah, apparently some amazing. electricity yeah. trick, yeah. isn't it? That I could, kind of yeah. I could yeah. see it falling out with friends. A friend comes over and whatever vibe they have changes the colour of my flooring and I'm sort yeah. of like, oh, yeah. I hate that. Get out. Well, even with lighting. Depending on what mood you're in. Like these, <laughs> these smart lighting systems. I mean, I saw a client recently and he he was actually, um, he works in theatre in the West End. So his biggest sort of investment um, to date on the property was the lighting. So he could change the colours of the lights. And then it was kind of incredible because we were looking at, you know, paint colour options. But then I'm like, well, what colour are you going to have your lighting? Because obviously, every paint color has almost you know 20 options mm. depending on the lighting that you settle on and um, but that would actually mean that somebody else could come into the space and change the kind of the tone and the feel of it purely on that light setting not having to repaint yeah yeah all very fascinating it is the thing i'm taking away is the bathroom you know you've mentioned it and it's one of my uh, my little pet things Every time I go into a restaurant, I check out their bathroom yeah. and I sort of judge them on that. Yeah. So uh, and, and, and if I was going to do one investment in, in the house before selling it, I think it's going to be the bathroom now from today's yeah. discussion. And the trick with bathrooms, of course, is you can spend not much money on the sanitary wear itself, but yeah. spend money on the sanitary fittings. Because yeah. you know, it's the taps and the, yeah. the flush that you actually touch. So if they're, yeah. you know, uh, if they're of, of quality and substance, I think you can you can get away with spending a lot less money than it looks like you've spent on, uh, on bathrooms. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. bathrooms are definitely an indicator, I think, aren't they, of uh, the quality of the rest of the property and um, and taste for sure. Yeah, Absolutely. I've just thought of one last question I want to ask you. When I moved into my property, it was empty except mm -hmm. for one painting on one wall. What that they left? Yeah. Why didn't they like it enough to take it? So when I took it down, there was a big hole in the wall behind ah. it. <laughs> so it wasn't the painting was <laughs> an issue, right? Have you got any tips for viewers? What to look for when they're viewing a property? Oh, I mean, it's, it's difficult to probe, isn't it, on a viewing, unless you're with the agent rather than the owner. Um, I think my advice is to make sure you get a good survey done. So don't necessarily just leave it up to your lender to provide the valuation survey that you pay 200 quid for. Have have at least a home buyer's survey, which is a bit more expensive, maybe four or 500 pounds, depending on the size of the property. But a home buyer's survey will kind of really kick the tyres on the property. And do you think um, they would actually take pictures off the walls and things like that? They'd be looking for the safe behind the paintings. Yeah, yeah I'm not sure, actually. Good question. I mean, they'll certainly, they'll certainly delve and probe more than a regular valuation survey um it's quite it's quite an unusual issue that uh, although I, I did many 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 years ago we sold a property where the owner moved in and he got went into the garage and there was this big kind of bit of uh, yellow and black tape across the circuit board saying dangerous do not use which of course wasn't there for the viewing so basically the the electrics were a problem and he hadn't had a proper survey done uh, and the, the trouble is to all intents and purposes buyers buy on the basis of caveat emptor you know it's buyer beware unless there is something that from the consumer protection regulations point of view, something that the agent stroke the owner has not disclosed that might have made you make a different purchase decision. Um, that might have qualified, actually. But it's um, it, it's difficult. I think it's, you know, th there's always going to be things that can be hidden. Um, you know, how do you know if the boiler's really working? You know, particularly if you're viewing in summer, you know, you can't touch a radiator to see if the heating's on because it wouldn't be on because it's July. Yeah. So, yeah, I think you, you've got to take a certain amount on the chin. Uh, and I've hardly ever come across cases where buyers have moved in, found problems, then sued the owner. Okay. Almost doesn't happen. does in other countries. In the US, Scotland, mm. that stuff happens a lot. But in the UK, it's kind of, you know, oh, well, take it on the chin and get on with it. Well, thank you very much, Russell, for joining us on the podcast today. It's absolutely fascinating to hear all your insights into property and what we can do to enhance our homes and prepare for that sale. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. If you enjoyed our podcast, please like and share with your friends and family who are working on their own home interiors project. Be sure to follow us on our Instagram, Facebook and YouTube channels at the DNA of Home Interiors. If you are looking for inspiration and help in designing your home project, check out Audrey Whelan's masterclasses and sign up for one today. 
And Audrey, what's that address again? It's audreywhelan.com forward slash events. And it also makes a great gift. And don't forget to check out cooldia.com to easily search, discover and shop furniture products across the entire retail market on one website. We hope you can join us next time.